so we spent a year on this show talking about what Swedenborg wrote. If you're going to put that kind of time into something, you should probably make sure it's something worth talking about, right? Rarely, if ever, has someone's life's body of work been as diverse and striking as Swedenborg's. He went from being the guy writing about anatomy, government, and mining to being the guy writing about angels, the spiritual significance of birds, and what kind of buildings they have in hell. He claimed to have first-hand experience with just about everything beyond the veil. It would be really cool if his works were this expansive portal into the true nature of the beyond, but how do we know that they are? Was he just crazy? Was he lying? Tonight we're going to take a look into the details of his life to see if they hold any answers to these questions. Stay tuned. Oh, it's been a year. I think that's... That's what it's been, right? A year uh, since we started this show. It was in the beginning of June last year. So thanks everybody for sticking with it. It's been a, it's been an awesome ride. It's been cool to see the thing progress and see our audience progress. Uh, it's been awesome. And I wanted I want to give a shout out to U R S T from Moldova. You're watching right now. It's three in the morning your time. Uh, that's probably a record for the, for the latest state up. So by this time next year, it'll be like six or like 12 noon the next day someone's watching i don't i don't know how it works out but thanks it's cool to see the audience grow we appreciate you guys all being here so we thought we would talk about the reason that we're all here which is this material that emmanuel swedenborg has swedenborg wrote this incredible unique uh can potentially life-changing stuff but what is it what's the nature of it is it legit i mean this is the first thing you're going to come up against if you try to if i someone tunes into this show and they hear me like well angels have you know this kind of shirt that they wear on this day of the week stuff that specific about afterlife how do you know that oh swedenborg told me who's swedenborg is he crazy does he know what he's talking about are you being taken for a loop does he just make it up that's what we want to look at today. So we can't know for sure, of course, uh, but we're going to get at it. Oh, yeah, right, right. If you don't know by now, my name is Curtis. Uh, I've been the host for this wonderful year, uh, and I'm with the Swedenborg Foundation, which is a nonprofit group that makes it all happen, and we want you to be part of the discussion. Live questions at the end of the show. You can get yours in any time, and we'll, we'll have a, an answer session at the end. Okay, so let's take a look at Swedenborg, and let's see if we can learn anything from his life that, that may be an indicator of uh, the reason for the stuff that he wrote. So, bef But before we look at uh, his sanity, let's do a quick intro to who Swedenborg was as a person. Okay, so... There is at least one person who already knows who Swedenborg is. There's a person who drew this. That's actual graffiti in this street in London where people do a lot of graffiti. That photo was taken by none other than Stephen McNeely. Uh, and there, if you look in the description of this video, you can see a little a link to his blog where he posted this, where he found this Swedenborg graffiti. So somebody in London knows, but in case the rest of you don't, here's a quick introduction to Swedenborg by Dr. Jonathan Rose. Hi, I'm Jonathan Rose, series editor of the New Century edition of the works of Emanuel Swedenborg. So maybe you've heard or read something interesting about this Emanuel Swedenborg, and you want to know more. Well, perhaps the most basic thing you should know, just for purposes of light conversation, is that Swedenborg was an 18th century Swedish scientist, philosopher, and theologian. Born 1688, died 1772. The next thing you should probably know is that he was brilliant. He was what people call a universal genius, a polymath, a renaissance man, ahead of his time. For instance, he was a submarine designer before there was such a thing, a psychologist 140 years before Freud, an aeronautical engineer 190 years before the Wright brothers. He was a mathematician, geologist, metallurgist, mineralogist, crystallographer, anatomist, botanist, chemist, physicist, cosmologist, astronomer. I'm not making this up, this is very well documented. He was an author, inventor, legislator, mining engineer, economist, editor, a poet, and a musician. He came up with the first rational design for flight and made anatomical discoveries that were well ahead of their time. He published 14,000 pages and left another 28,000 pages in manuscript. So he was one of those types. 
But perhaps the most important, but also controversial thing about him was that he claimed that in his mid-50s he had a spiritual awakening that opened the afterlife to him while he was still alive in this world. He was not just alive, but functioning with indefatigable energy. You could think of him as having a near-death experience that went on for 29 years while he was living his daily life, seeing friends, participating in the Swedish government, and writing more books. So there's a little of Swedenborg, uh, and here's a little more of Swedenborg that we put together. This is uh, from a biography of Swedenborg, uh, and it's just kind of a summary that we did, uh, not a direct quote. Uh, Swedenborg was the son of a prominent Lutheran bishop. He was educated at U Ups uh, Uppsala, Uppsala University and, and in his studies abroad. He mastered many crafts such as watchmaking, cabinet making, brass instrument making, engraving, lens grinding. He was the inventor of new kinds of practical mining and smelting equipment. He was the assistant to Sweden's most famous inventor, <coughs> who is uh, Christopher Polhelm or Polem or some similar pronunciation. Started the publication of a scientific journal. He was appointed by the king to be special assessor on Sweden's boards of mines. Commissioned by the king to help create a new canal in Sweden, he was given a seat in the House of Nobles by the queen, wrote a number of papers on trade, commerce, and industry, helped establish a museum of technology and a museum of mining in Sweden, published a number of scholarly scientific books, one of the earliest to publish a theory consistent with modern geology, and accepted into Sweden's Royal Academy of Sciences. Believe it or not, that's still a very truncated biography. We just took a few points. He did a lot of stuff, okay? And we're not here to just list off his accomplishments, but we thought we would start with it so we have a little background on who we're talking about. So this is a guy that did a lot of stuff, smart guy, successful guy. But as Dr. Jonathan Rose mentioned, in his mid-50s, his career path took a drastic turn. Uh, you could say to the right or left, I don't think it really matters, but he took this drastic turn and he started to report his spiritual experiences and catalog those and set out on this spiritual writing phase. Uh, this is where it gets, nobody's thinking that, oh, Swedenborg's crazy because he figured out how to make a canal in Sweden. But when you start to talk about the levels of heaven and the way that spirits interact with our minds, you start to open yourself up to these questions that we're going to ask now. And the first one that I think people have when they hear of Swedenborg could be, was he just making it all up? We're going to find that out now. So this is something that people have been wondering about Swedenborg since Swedenborg started doing the thing Swedenborg is now known for, this spiritual stuff. Uh, and you don't have to take my word for it, Dr. Jim Lawrence uh, echoes this sentiment and, and brings it into a, a fuller explanation. So let's check out what he had to say. Well, the question of Swedenborg's sanity or insanity has been um, a, a, a subject of serious concern even when he was still alive. When he first became known as a a seer into the spiritual world, immediately there was attention flocking to him. We can go back into the uh, discourse of the day and see that there were even newspaper cartoons uh, about the, the crazy seer out on the edge of Stockholm. And there was uh, the first primary category of discourse around whether he was crazy or not, uh, centered more on whether he was possibly faking it or not whether he was in fact a storyteller and uh, a charlatan trying to gain attention and credence to himself. Was he just making it up? Was he not uh, actually visiting the levels of heaven or the world of spirits? Was he just saying that he did? Did he just sit down in his little like garden house and say, I'm going to make all this up? Well, we can't know that for sure, but we can, like you would do in any trial, look at potential motives. We got to produce a motive if he's going to be lying like this. So let's look at the reasons why a lot of people lie, starting with number one, <laughs> money, right? You might want to lie if you're going to get money out of it. So was this all just a, a scam? Was it all a ruse to make cash with? I brought that question to Dr. Jonathan Rose, who we saw a minute ago, and I asked him, was Swedenborg just in this for the money? The idea that Swedenborg was writing these books in order to make money is quite laughable. We have it on very good testimony that his practice was to publish these books on very expensive paper and then give them to the booksellers so that the booksellers kept 
100% of the proceeds of the sale of the volumes. In other words, he never asked for anything coming back. We have this on the authority of a good friend of his named Kuno, Johann Christian Kuno, who lived in Amsterdam. They were um, friends and they lived in the same city for a number of years. And Kuno says, he has published his manifold writings in England and in this country entirely at his own expense and has never gained a farthing from their sale. A farthing was a quarter of a penny. It was the smallest sort of shred of, of coinage at that time. Uh, Kuno goes on, all these writings are printed on large and expensive paper, and yet he gives them all away. The booksellers to whom he gives them for sale charge as much for them as they can get. The bookseller himself mentioned to me that the author never demands an account either from himself or any other dealer. In other words, Swedenborg never goes back to the booksellers and says, you know, where's all the income that you got from the sale of those books? So he, he made no money whatsoever from the sale of his books. So note to self, if I want to write books to make money, don't give them away, right? This is, this is economics 101 or one, economics one. If you want to make money, don't give away the thing that you're trying to make money with, which apparently Swedenborg did. He was, a, he was first of all, taking a decent amount out of pocket to print this stuff. And the printing was more expensive back then, I would assume, than it is now. But then he was just saying, okay, if you guys will have this on your shelf and, and sell it, uh, I'll give you um, the profits. So that's not such a good piece of evidence for uh, Swedenborg was trying to make money off this. If you So we can't know for sure, but that that's pretty tough to get around. He obviously wouldn't say out you know, to the public if he was trying to make money right? But maybe he would let something slip in private if he actually was somehow. Uh, let's see, we have a, actually a little segment from a letter that he wrote to somebody, Thomas Hartley. He said in it, moreover, I have as much of this world's wealth as I need, and I neither seek nor wish for more. So, in private as well, he's saying, nah, my, um, money ain't no thing. Uh, money's cool. I, I don't need it. Um, so, not to mention, um, he was already making money. He, he already had a good job. He was a Swedish assessor of mines, which was a very powerful position back in those days when Sweden was a world power and the mining industry was a big deal. Uh, he actually, when he started writing his books, um, took like uh, some kind of, he he resigned from there and took some kind of like half salary or less. So he actually started making less money once he was writing these books. So I really have a hard time believing it was a money thing because he didn't sell them for money. He didn't want money. He started making less money to do it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's not a money thing. My opinion doesn't have to be yours. However, that's not the only reason that people lie about stuff. The other, there's another thing people can get that's not money, but it is fame. <laughs> Yeah, man, hear that crowd? Doesn't that just get your blood, like, pumping? Oh, these people think I'm so cool. Maybe Swedenborg wanted to feel that, right? So, was he doing this to gain fame? So I asked Jonathan Rose again. I pressed him and said, well, didn't Swedenborg just want to do this to beef up his reputation? And this is what he said back to me. It is not true that Swedenborg needed some boost to his reputation. Uh, he already... It wasn't like he was nobody before he wrote these books. He was internationally famous. He had published a major work, a Principia, uh, in three large folio volumes that got him a lot of attention in Germany and elsewhere in the continent. He was so well known in Europe at the time that the newspapers used to report his movements. Swedenborg has left Amsterdam and is now headed for Italy or what have you. He had a very strong and very good reputation it was something that I think he must have considered very carefully before stepping onto this path because he knew that he was risking that reputation in order to follow the call that he felt that he had received. After he started writing these works, at first he wrote them anonymously, so it didn't have an impact on his reputation. But around 1760, 1759, 1760, it began to be known that he was the one publishing these books. And uh, this opened up a whole can of worms for him. There were people who uh, thought very ill of him as a result of doing these books. He paid a price. People who liked what he wrote, they too were attacked, uh, attacked in print. Uh, there were articles in Germany that came out 
uh, against him from the clergy, uh, from a consistory in Württemberg in Germany. So he paid quite a price. There were people who wanted, there was a movement at some point uh, to have him banned from the government. Uh, that was not successful because he was very highly respected and very well connected. In a time now when we have cell phones and things where, you know, you can actually find out whether someone's lying or not more easily today, uh, it surprised us to think of the kind of just bald-faced lies being told about him. Lies that he was in Amsterdam and doing this and that uh, when he wasn't there. He, he hadn't been there for a year and a half and, and things like this, but people would just tell these lies about him. Some people just seemed to particularly pick on him, you know, because he sort of had a target on his back ever since he started publishing these books. It's not a real good image enhancer. Um, if anybody is a publicist in training, or you're going to try to make a career out of getting your name out there, uh, you, you probably don't want to go down this path. And the real advice I have for you centers on something that he said. You may have missed it in there. Uh, we're going to bring it up here in, uh, this is a little selection from the Swedenborg Epic 362. Uh, in Amsterdam, the printing of the new work went on apace. It was finished by the end of September. So this is talking about one of his books, 1768. From the 1st of October, Swedenborg sent a copy of it to Dr. Bayer. This was the first of his theological books to which he affixed his name, the title page reading, The Lights of Wisdom Concerning Conjugal Love, After Which Follow Pleasures of Insanity Concerning Scoratory Love, by Emanuel Swedenborg, a Swede. So that was his first book he put his name on. By then he was 80, and he'd already been publishing his spiritual books for 20 years. So, as I was saying, if you're going to be a publicist, first rule, make sure your client puts their name on their books, because otherwise it's hard to get famous if you don't put your name on your work, right? So Swedenborg, not only was he already famous for really legit reasons. Everybody thought, oh, this guy's so smart. He's publishing all this scientific stuff. He's awesome. We put his name in the paper. Not only that, but, and he knew he was risking it by going in this direction, but also he didn't even put his name on the books for a long, long time. And it was only, he only started putting his name on the books after people started to guess that it was him. It wasn't like he's like, okay, now I'm, now I'm ready to be famous. I mean, so, so there you have two pretty strong reasons why the whole, um, fame-seeking angle doesn't seem to fit. You could say that he was weirdly obsessed with fame, but was trying to gain anonymous fame through his... Uh, it's a stretch. It becomes more of a stretch. It doesn't... The dots don't seem to connect, man. Uh, in the chat room, B-Boy Geometry, you're welcome. Nice chatting with you. Uh, <laughs> and then I want to say that it's not just money or fame, though, that people can want, because there is a special third category of thing people can be looking for. And it could be that even though he already had money or didn't want more money and he already had fame, there's a special kind of adoration that maybe you can only get through religious type literature like he was putting out. And that category is... I'm sorry about that one. I'm really sorry. Um, worship. That he didn't want to just be known as a great scientist and a smart guy. He wanted people to... to deify him or, or to look up to him as some kind of spiritual leader. He wanted to be like the, what, the contemporary cult leaders, you know, people that are surrounded by a crowd of adoring followers who th see you as, as more than a person even, that this is, you are the center of their life. And maybe that's what he was looking for, and he was willing to throw away his scientific career to get this sort of adulation. So, if we're going to say that, we got to find some evidence, so let's take a look in Swedenborg's letters. Uh, this, is a le th this is more of that letter to Thomas Hartley. And he's saying to Thomas Hartley, this is Swedenborg writing, I rejoice at the friendship which you manifest in your letter, and I thank you sincerely for both, but especially for your friendship. The praises with which you overwhelm me I receive simply as expressions of your love for the truths contained in my writings, and I refer them as their source to the Lord our Savior, from whom is everything true, because he is the truth itself. So you could say, oh, that's megalomania. He's saying that God is putting true things into his writings. But to me, I see that as a bit of deflection. That Thomas Hartley is like, Swedenborg, I don't know his actual words, but I'm assuming it was something like, Swedenborg, you rock. You're the most awesome person in the world for writing these. And Swedenborg is saying, you know, God is cool. I I'm, I'm just trying to channel that through, you know. So to me, that seems like not 
the sign of somebody who's trying to gain adoration. But maybe that's not good enough for you. Let's go a little bit farther. This is from the Swedenborg Epic, page 270 to 272. This is a little bit long, but it's worth hearing the story because this, what do you do if you're confronted with somebody who flat out says, I want to be your disciple? This is what Swedenborg was dealing with here. His objections notwithstanding, Count Bond was deeply impressed by Swedenborg's books, for he wrote about them to Baron Hetzel, or Hetzel, a literary friend in Rotterdam, who immediately became an enthusiastic reader of the works, including Arcana, which is now translated Secrets of Heaven. Hetzel lasts no time in communicating to Count Bond his ardent desire to make Swedenborg's acquaintance. He asked him to deliver a note to the assessor, the assessor uh, being Swedenborg, in which Hetzel states that from his early youth he has striven after truth and now, having become acquainted with Swedenborg's extraordinary insight and illumination, he wishes to become his disciple and follow him to, quote, to taste the waters of the same fountain of wisdom from which Swedenborg was drinking. In return for this favor, Baron Hetzel offered to translate all of Swedenborg's writings into German and French. So, Swedenborg has somebody, and not just anybody, a count, somebody who's high-ranking, say, I want to be your disciple. So let's see, if, if you want worship, here's your chance to step in and get it. Swedenborg's reply to this letter is an excellent example of his friendliness and tact. Politely, he explains, and this is probably going to say politely, he explains, yes, you can be my disciple. Politely, he explains to Bond that, since his books are published anonymously, he cannot enter into correspondence with anyone abroad. He asks Count Bond to express his pleasure that Baron Hetzel found satisfaction in his writings. So, here you have somebody, high, a high-ranking somebody, a count of some kind saying, you have the truth. You are so awesome. Can I be your disciple? Translate your books for you. What do you say, man? And Swedenborg says, no, that's all right. That's fine. I'm kind of doing this anonymously, so don't worry about it. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you like the books. All right? So that is too big a fish to let get away. You can't convince me that Swedenborg was looking to be worshipped uh, and he let somebody like that just skate. Um, furthermore, he never started a church. There are churches founded on Swedenborg's teachings, but they popped up afterwards. He never had followers. He never had people that lived in a commune with him or uh, spent their time following him from city to city. He didn't even, to my knowledge, even give lectures. You know, it was all just writing books and publishing them, for the most part, anonymously. It just doesn't sync up. If you're trying to get adoration, you're making all the wrong moves. You know, uh, maybe he was really smart at everything, but had no idea how to get people to worship him. I, I just don't see it, man. I don't see You're not convincing me with this. He was lying stuff. Um, and that, actually, Jim Lawrence has a final wrinkle to put into that. So let's hear what he has to say about it here. But the thesis of being a charlatan or uh, just a con man uh, fell away f- as a serious possibility because at that time people did not know how extensive his diaries were. His diaries were not discovered uh, for quite a number of years after his death and did not begin to uh, uh, receive serious attention and be translated and published for a half a century uh, after his death. And then it was clear that he had a lot going on in his own sense of himself, and he wasn't uh, merely telling tales. So Swedenborg's diaries, which he wasn't publishing, although they got published after his death, and we read some of them on this show. Sorry about that, Swedenborg. Um, (laughs) They, hopefully you forgive us, uh, they, uh, he kept those, and it's, it's not like, Today, I succeeded in convincing everyone that I see angels. This is so great. He's, he's, you know, if he's lying, he's lying to himself, too, because he keeps these long diaries about the things he records, his spiritual experiences, his dreams, all kinds of stuff, and, and it just doesn't show that. So, anyone's free to believe that he was making it up. The evidence doesn't seem to point in that way, in my humble opinion, but it's up to you now. The ball's in your court. So, uh, we've got that. Was he lying? But beyond that, maybe he thought he was telling the truth, but he was out of his mind. You see, spirit, you talk to spirits, you got to be out of your mind, right? So let's take a look now. Was Swedenborg crazy? So, yeah, I mean, this stuff is pretty out there. He's 
not only saying that he hears voices, but that he can see where the voices are coming from, that he can talk to them, he can take these trips into these other worlds, that he knows all these things about God, you know, is he just out of his mind? So I thought I would start by asking a professor of psychology, so I posed the question to Dr. Sony Werner, uh, was Swedenborg insane? Uh, insanity has an interesting history as a word that's used in the psychological field and in the legal field. And the long and short of it is that a lot of words that were used, let's say, 50 to 100 years ago in psychology, such as the word insanity, is not used as much officially anymore. We have different words like schizophrenic or somebody's depressed, things like that. We're a little more specific about behaviors. So currently, among professional psychologists, we don't actually use the word insane anymore. However, when there's a cross between psychology and the law, that is called forensic psychology, that's where the word insanity comes up. So if in the news today, you might hear somebody say, they are considered insane, so they're not held responsible for their actions. And so a jury or a judge might consider somebody insane, and it might be a temporary insanity. For instance, they, they flew off the handle and they had a, a, just a terrible reaction to some bad news and they went out and killed somebody. They were temporarily insane. It's a very rare thing that a judge will say that, but it has happened. And then uh, there are other times when they wonder whether somebody is competent to stand trial. It's not the same as being insane and being aggressive, but competent is more in the area of, let's say, being mentally challenged or developmentally delayed cognitively. If you use the general statement of, is somebody insane? Maybe not in the world of psychologists, but in common language, people might say, oh, he was just insane because he bought that new car, right? So we might use that if we're saying, is Swedenborg insane? Was he insane? Well, I'd rather replace the word insanity with, is somebody responsible for their actions? Uh, did they harm anybody during a fit of some kind of um, temporary or long-term time period where they were really not doing reasonable things? So. One could either look at being competent, or being responsible, or being uh, harmful to others, and then should we make them face consequences. And in my opinion, Swedenborg did not have those problems. He had some unusual experiences, that's for sure, but I would not say that he was insane by the current legal standard of what is insane. So competent, responsible, uh, you know, is he harming other people? We can't sit down with Swedenborg and diagnose, but we could do sort of what a jury does and, and try to figure out, is this person insane? Can they be held responsible for their actions? And a lot of the, you know, modern definitions of mental illness have to do with functionality. Like, is it is it impairing your ability to function? So what we want to do here is look at... You know, the best we can do is look at was Swedenborg, was he showing in his life? We, we can't know, did you really see angels or not? But was the rest of his life showing the symptoms of a broken mind? So what I want to do is first take a look at, you know, because usually if you have some kind of mental issue, it, it hampers your ability to do constructive, organized work. So not even counting the beginning of Swedenborg's life, let's take a look at after he started writing his spiritual books, how productive he was, how much work he was doing. And to sort of lay out the process, even just of the writing of the books, again, Dr. Jonathan Rose weighs in. He published almost 14,000 pages of material, and his pages were large, so each page of that printed material represented about four handwritten pages that went into it. So those 14,000 pages represent 56,000 pages that he had written out by hand, and you wouldn't just write one draft and publish it, he would write the work and then write it over again, so, every, so that's over 100,000 pages of material that ended up in published form. So he wrote a tremendous amount, and it was very coherent, uh, very systematic. He would number the paragraphs of his work so that he could index them. As he was writing his work, he would be creating an index to that work so that he would cross-reference it. One work of his alone, his book on uh, the Book of Revelation, uh, that's been traditionally titled Apocalypse Revealed, or in the New Century Edition as Revelation Unveiled, has no fewer than 2,493 internal cross-references from one part of the book to another. This is something that requires a tremendous amount of follow-through 
to achieve, and he has a lot of cross-references from one book to another. I'm amazed what he did with Secrets of Heaven. It's his longest published theological work, 4,559 pages in the first edition, and each of those pages represents about four pages of manuscript. He, in the course of producing this work, started indexing it before the volumes even appeared in print. So he was creating a working index to this thing. What he would do with each section that he wrote, he would then index it right away. And so he'd have an index that had point by point, what had he said in this long book. Then he would take those index entries and he would combine similar ones. So if we were on a certain theme, he would bring together, oh, here's another one that's about that, here's another one. And he would assemble these so that you have a whole series of references at the end of one statement. And then he would take a series of those statements and build them into whole paragraphs that would give you sort of a whole overview of what he had said. It's incredible to think of the amount of labor that he did just to write out by hand 4,559 pages times four, twice, to produce that work, but then to produce not one level of index, not two levels, but three levels of index to that whole work is, is tremendous to me. The amount of follow through that you have to do. He published that book over an eight year period and he was writing it for a couple of years before he started publishing the first volume. So it represents over a decade of sustained effort this is not the work of a madman. Uh, this is someone who, who had a very capable mind, a very focused mind, and was going after certain goals and was taking logical, rational steps to get toward those goals. At the same time as he was writing those works, he was also distributing them all over Europe, writing cover letters to people. He was a one-man publishing and distribution channel um, who else did he have to work with him on it? His output over 27 years is incredible. These 25 Latin volumes, three and a half million Latin words that he wrote during that time period, and another couple of million words that are left in manuscript form. So focused and, and uh, altering his format to better achieve certain goals. It's just not, to my mind, the ravings of a lunatic. It just isn't. So if there was a part of Swedenborg's brain that was broken, the part that can tell if, you know, that, that is going off and seeing angels. There's certainly a part that's still working. I mean, you look at, as he was mentioning, the, the ability to do productive work and organize and plan out volumes and write at the rate that he wrote at. I, I, can't, I can't do that with my sane brain. You know, so something is working, but not only is he able to write, he's able to index and put them together, cross-reference, all these activities that very much grasp what a person is looking for when they're reading the work. And not only that, he had his stuff together enough to, oh, who do I want to send this to in Europe that it might make an impact on? I know the protocol to get to this person. I'm going to write a cover letter. I'm going to go at this. I'm going to take this to the printer. I know how to work with the printer. You know, there's no records of him and printers having fallouts that I know of that so something was working right, no matter what, some part there. And Dr. George Dole comments on this further. This is in an upcoming introduction to one of the new translations, a new century edition of Swedenborg's work. By strictly materialistic criteria, saying there's only a physical world, Swedenborg's accounts must be judged hallucinatory, as such cast serious doubts on his sanity. By all accounts, however, he seems to have been completely sane, quite able to lead a responsible and productive life. An emissary of Immanuel Kant visited Swedenborg at his home and found him, quote, a reasonable, polite, and open-hearted man, and also a man of learning. His Stockholm neighbor, Karl Ros Robsam, states that even in his old age, he was cheerful, merry, and charming in company. In his vol vol voluminous, <laughs> I remember tripping over this earlier, voluminous writing is ad admirably consistent and coherent. I am not aware of any other instance of hallucinations on a single theme recurring from what must have been months meticulously recorded and lucidly summarized, and fostering freedom of religious thinking and thoughtful social living. Polonius' musing may be appropriate. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. And another thing, to, to, Swedenborg didn't degenerate. 
You know, he was writing for 27 years. He, it's not like he, if you have a, some kind of mental condition, you often deteriorate as you go on. But he didn't, his uh, hallucinations or his things that he saw didn't change. You know, the, the world that he's describing in his last book is the same as in his first book. He's also able to continue to write at the same pace. He's not dropping things. So whatever's going on, um, there's something, uh, he is not showing the signs of somebody who's breaking down. Also, in the Swedenborg epic, page 287, which is a great biography of Swedenborg, when entering upon his spiritual function, Swedenborg did not relinquish his political duties. To contribute his best for the good of his country, he considered to be implied in his service as a nobleman and the head of a family. There is no evidence that he ever missed a session of the imperial diet. So, for what it's worth, he kept up his political role. Some people say politicians are crazy anyway, saying, but he was able to continue to function in government alongside writing. And actually, there's a lot about um, how he was able to continue to function in the world. And we want to go, you know, the best we can do now, looking back centuries later, is to get anecdotes from the people who were actually around him. Did he seem crazy? Did he act like he was crazy? So here's a description of him uh, from a friend of his in a letter that, that Dr. Rose is reading for us here. So check it out. Kuno writes of Swedenborg that he lived with simple folks who kept a shop in which they sold chintz, muslin, handkerchiefs, and the like, and who had quite a number of little children. I inquired, writes Kuno, of the landlady whether the old gentleman did not require very much attention. If I can hit pause there for a second and just say, um, a Swedish nobleman staying in the house it's, it's it's interesting that he would stay in the house of these shopkeepers now the shopkeepers had a servant who would help them and so on but they weren't at that upper echelon of society you don't you know the the highest nobility you wouldn't work in that same way and so he was asking whether this landlady had to work you know was 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 it sort of intimidating to take care of Swedenborg and she answered he scarcely requires any, meaning any attention. The servant has nothing else to do for him except in the morning to lay a fire for him in the fireplace. Every evening, Swedenborg goes to bed at seven and gets up in the morning at eight. We do not trouble ourselves any more about him. During the day, he keeps up the fire himself. He waits upon himself in everything so that we scarcely know whether there's anyone else in the house or not. I should like him to be with us during the rest of his life. My children will miss him the most for he never goes out without bringing them home some sweets. The little rogues also dote upon the old gentleman so much that they prefer him to their own parents. So he lived in a very simple style. People commented also on the fact that he did not um, have a servant. He didn't travel with a servant. It was very, for a nobleman, not even to have one, you know, a, a boy or a girl to help him in any way uh, was highly unusual. Uh, he was kind of, low maintenance as, as you hear there so easy to get along with friendly kids liked him uh didn't travel extravagantly this is it's pretty down to earth stuff and actually kids thought he was super cool as is evidenced by this photo uh this is a bust in sweden made by an artist there it's, it's got swedenborg's head up there and it says swedenborg and below it there is this plaque and this is the picture on the plaque and this is Swedenborg with a mirror showing it to a little girl. And this is based on a story that uh, was said to have occurred with Swedenborg. And I'm going to read it for you now. This is out of that same biography, the Swedenborg epic. A charming anecdote is told about his near neighbor, little Greta Askbom, whose father was on friendly terms with the assessor, the assessor being Swedenborg. Greta had often asked Uncle Swedenborg to show her an angel, and at last he consented. He placed her before a curtain and said, now you will see an angel. He drew the curtain aside, and the little girl saw herself reflected in a mirror. So that's cute, and actually, so the plaque had sort of what it would look like, but this is how a kid envisioned that scene happening. Ah, an angel! I'm an angel! So I'm just saying, it shows a little humor, right? It shows pretty connected, you know, to, to, to do a trick like that. There was once a little tiny zoo that I went to in Canada, right? I was in Canada. I went to this zoo. It was like one of the, it wasn't like a big official zoo. It was a small zoo. And they had one little exhibit that, that said, uh, in here is the North American monkey. And you go down this little tunnel and it says behind this curtain is a North American monkey and you lift it up and it's you. Um, I wish, you know, I'd gone to Swedenborg instead. 
He's <laughs> uh, although there's nothing that bad about being a North American monkey. I'll take that title too. So that is just a. These are just some little anecdotes. This is these are character witnesses that we're bringing forward, right? So we're trying to see when he started doing this spiritual writing, did he stop being able to function like a normal person in his interactions with other people? Was he losing his ability to socialize? Doesn't seem like it. And also, he wasn't losing his ability to still do the things he was doing before he would, as people would accuse him of, go insane. So we have a couple other descriptions of just how much he was still doing, even while we learned already how much work that writing was. That was a lot of work. Handwritten, that much material, cross-referencing, indexing for decades, that he was really going at it, but that didn't take up the entire bandwidth of his life even. He was able to do these things that he, st- that he was already doing back when everyone agreed that he was sane. And Dr. Rose has a little more on this here. When Swedenborg got into a spiritual phase, he did stop working at the Swedish uh, College of Mines the board of mines that was supervising all the engineering and everything having to do with the mining trade, which is very lucrative in Sweden. But he continued playing a role in government. Because he was the oldest in his family, he had a seat in the government, in the House of the Swedish House of Nobles. And he was an active participant in the government, even during the time that he was publishing this amazing amount of other material that he put out on spiritual topics. He also was writing a number of things. Uh, he published on the subject of uh, the exchange rate, hardly a spiritual topic. He wrote about doing away with paper money, about exporting copper. He defended the political freedom in Sweden at the time. He also wrote practical works. He published something on the inlaying marble, the techniques involved in that marquetry of inlaying marble. Uh, at the very end of his life, when he was still publishing spiritual things, he came out with a second edition of a work he'd written earlier on deflation and inflation. This is someone who was still very engaged with the world and was writing on political topics and was loved and revered by some in the government and hated by others for his positions and so on, but he was still a player, you might say. Or, in other words, a normal guy. That, you know, every politician is loved by some, hated by some. So he was able to do that. He still, and not only that he was still doing that stuff, but he still cared. He still cared about things like inflation and deflation and how to do marble and things like the political freedom in Sweden. Like he wasn't detached. I've found my world where I live now in the company of spirits and angels and I don't need to bother with earthlings. He, w- he still cared. Everything... Uh, the only thing that was out of whack was the stuff he was reporting. Everything else fit, and we actually have uh, some people who were noticing that very same thing in his time, and Jim Lawrence is going to fill us in on those. There were still quite a few people who came over to visit him while he was still alive because of the tales of his extraordinary experiences, and it was common uh, for people like the Prime Minister of Sweden, Anders uh, von Hopkin, one of his best friends, uh, or the Danish uh, general uh, Christian Tuxen, who had major ambassadorial duties in Scandinavia, uh, uh, were remark, w- would remark on how sane he seemed while he talked about such amazing things, that he could be such an accomplished person, and then speak about his other world uh, travels as matter-of-factly as if he were talking about the trip he took to town the day before, um, so that his, so that he was regarded in his own context as someone who didn't come off as fantastical about it, but rather more matter-of-fact uh, about it. So these are people in his own time who are seeing, okay, the stuff he's saying is out there, but he says it like he's a normal person, so I don't know what to make of it. I think that people have often not known what to make of Swedenborg, someone who seemed so sane and yet had such incredible reports of the things he's heard and seen. So uh, we're going to, in the next segment, kind of leave it with you. Um, but if you're enjoying the ride that we're taking you on right now, feel free to give this video the thumbs up. If you like the video, like it on YouTube. That will tell YouTube that we're cool. And also, if you haven't, please subscribe to our channel because that is is will get our videos to you but also it tells youtube that we're cool that shows our videos to more people and the people who enjoy it find it and bring back here all right so we've taken a look is swedenborg lying doesn't seem like it to me is he crazy uh there seems to be a lot of good evidence that 
uh, his brain is not broken. Uh, you can say that the content means it is, but at least the form doesn't. So that's up to you too. Let's just take a look at the whole picture uh, in this next segment, and then it'll be up to everyone to pass their own verdict. So see you then. By the way, that's a picture of Swedenborg's house or, or the, the garden area. That that little thing isn't his house; that's his garden house. But that that I believe is the property where he lived in Stockholm for at least a good portion of his life. So take what you like. I mean, this is this is up to each of us individually. This is the segment where I'm supposed to just say go choose. But I'm going to put more on the table because I couldn't figure out where else to fit this. I want to talk just briefly about content, the content of Swedenborg's work, I believe, lends itself in a way to saying he wasn't lying and he wasn't crazy. And what I mean by that is, even though the content is what got this whole thing started, he's saying he's talking to spirits and angels, but the way that he does it certainly doesn't support the he's lying hypothesis. He started with Secrets of Heaven or Arcana Celestia. He didn't start with Heaven and Hell. If you wanted to make a name for yourself, if you wanted to be uh, famous, if you wanted to sell books, get money, you would start with something like Heaven and Hell. If you've ever gotten into Secrets of Heaven at all, it is huge and it is dense and it is obscure and technical. It's his walkthrough of the internal symbolism of the uh, book of Genesis, um, and, th- and Genesis and, and onward into Exodus. Um, it's just not the kind of, it's not bestseller material. And, and he started with that. And, the, and, uh, because he felt like, oh, this is, this is the way we're supposed to go. He even comments on it in his diary, spiritual experiences, four, four, two, two. Um, this is him talking about his sales with angels. I received a letter saying that not more than four copies had been sold within two months, and when this was made known to the angels, they were indeed surprised, but they said that it must be left to the providence of the Lord, and that it is such that it compels no one. So, you know, the angels are like, bro, you you only sold four books in two months? (laughs) So that was the world Swedenborg was living in because of the, the content that he wasn't doing it initially to be sensational. So I'm just saying, you'd think you'd think that uh, if you're going for fame, you would look like you're going for fame. Also, the content itself just doesn't lend itself to those interpretations. Uh, it's all, it, you know, he says you can go to heaven living any path, living any religion as long as you're doing right by what you believe. It doesn't say you all have to read my books, or it doesn't say Swedenborg is the second coming of Jesus, as a lot of cult leaders have. Also, there's the, his material is so consistent, and it's weirdly specific. Like, Secrets of Heaven didn't sell because it was so specific, and it, was a, it wasn't just like, I'm going to take you on an emotional journey. It's like, this is, it's like a textbook. You know, it's like a textbook, and textbooks are written, uh, and they're, they're not always as interesting as they could be because they're about real stuff. So, Uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, we're doing this episode about Swedenborg. We shouldn't necessarily need to focus much on Swedenborg the person. He didn't want to in his books. That's why he would publish anonymously. He would just try to get himself out of the way and let the message go through. But Swedenborg is what you encounter when you first encounter the message. Because who is Swedenborg? How do we trust him? How do we know he wasn't doing this or doing that? It's things that everybody who does who reports a spiritual experience goes through, isn't it? I mean, if you if you say you had a near death experience now, people say you're lying, you're crazy. So it's good to just kind of take a look at that angle. Um, again, you've seen the evidence. It's up to you. Uh, in case you need more help making up your mind, we're going to take a little tour now of how people throughout history since Swedenborg wrote up until the present, have seen Swedenborg's works. And our tour guide will be Dr. Jim Lawrence. So here's what he had to say. As the 19th century unfolded, we have in the middle of that century the rise of psychiatry and psychology. And we have the next phase of fascination with Swedenborg's biography in terms of his psychological state. And we get a series of significant authors and figures who use Swedenborg as a test case or as a subject case to assess what was going on with him. And all of them have uh, psychological theories about what was going on with him. Some that are rather negative uh, assessments uh, in terms of his sanity and others that are more positive towards his sanity. 
Then there are the uh, some recent scholars at the University of Durham in England, uh, Simon Jones and Charles Fernibu, who are promoting a category uh, for understanding some extraordinary states and cultural history that they're calling hallucinations without mental disorder, or HWMD. Um, and these would be cases where the person is regarded as having a, a very effect, a, a, an affected and grounded outward life, but a very uh, eruptive inner spiritual psychological life. Another category that was arising also in the 19th century that was different than psychology, uh, that had a different approach to this material and an equal if not greater fascination with the phenomena, and that's the modern spiritualist tradition. Swedenborg is today often cited by historians of culture, say someone like Nicholas Goodrick Clark, who pegs Swedenborg as the first author in Western history to have works that would today be thought of as spiritualist. So Swedenborg in the spiritualist tradition is, is deeply valued. Uh, he's one of the pioneers and heroes in spiritualist history literature. Uh, such important researchers as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Cullen Wilson in England in uh, very recent times, uh, rate him as one of the uh, mastodons of spiritualist uh, experience and one of the pathfinders for a new break, a new open and breaking field of cultural human experience that Swedenborg was in the vanguard. Our fourth category of figures who have addressed Swedenborg's sanity might be thought of as some of the most common names we hear about who have read Swedenborg. And these would be uh, some of the great literary figures of Western uh, history and culture, William Blake, uh, William Butler Yeats, uh, people like the Brownings and Jorge Luis Borges in the 20th century, Czesla Milos in the 20th century. These are all figures who valued the um, extraordinary revelatory information and material, as well as the profile of a seer uh, writing visionary text for uh, the high and the true in culture. So they regard Swedenborg's uh, material uh, from a, as literary um, fuel and who read him as something of a of a profit for a, a better way in a better world. So those are some ways that people have looked at Swedenborg, but there's a last category, uh, a last way that you can take the experience and interpretation you can put on it, and Jim says it very well, so I'll let him take it away. There is the category that's been with the Swedenborgian story from the very beginning, and that are uh, that is uh, the viewpoint of the big majority of those who are in the churches that have grown up uh, out of Swedenborg's work. There is also a way to understand Swedenborg's um, uh, story uh, in his own words, uh, to, to take him on his own terms, to have the viewpoint that he knew what was going on with him and that his, his story of himself is the truest story that can exist of what came through him. And that is that he simply had for the divine's own reasons and purposes, um, a special gift of being involved in a visionary tradition and work uh, in order to give the world something that was vitally needed. And, uh, and that he went through the experiences of his revelatory work week by week, month by month, year by year, for 27 years, uh, simply as a matter of course. So there you have it. We gave you all the evidence that we have. Those are the different ways you can take it in case you needed a study guide or something like that. It's up to you. And Swedenborg knew that it would be up to you when he was writing. He, he, he was, as we've been showing this show, he was with it. He understood what it was going to look like when he was writing this stuff. In fact, near the beginning of his first book, Secrets of Heaven 68, he wrote this. 
I realize many will claim that no one can talk to spirits and angels as long as bodily life continues, or that I am hallucinating, or that I have circulated such stories in order to play on people's credulity, and so on. But none of this worries me. I have seen, I have heard, I have felt. So, there you go. It's up to you. Want to hear your thoughts and your questions on the other side of this break? Get them in if you haven't already, and we'll go to our live segment. All right, so let's uh, let's do our questions, man. The questions are the best part of the show, right? So let's get to them. Okay, we have a few here. Micah, YouTube. Many thanks to you, Curtis. You're welcome, Micah, and your colleagues for these amazing episodes. Could you say a few words about what Swedenborg calls remnants with thanks? Okay, of course I would, and thanks for your politeness. Remnants or, or remains, uh, is uh, it's often translated. I'm trying to think of if there's a new word for it in the new translations. I'm not sure, but um, basically... A remnant is the thing that God stores up in people. Uh, the good and the true, the best states of innocence and peace and love, the, the, the most precious things inside of us. God, as we experience them being a little kid growing up, God takes them, puts them inside us where they're safe. And it's this sort of um, memory of the true depth of things or, or, or of love, experiences of, of what's good that is called out in times of trial, is kind of used as a way to show us there is a better way. Remember how this feels. Remember how this felt. So that God is is using that part of us, the remnant. Um, it's, it's when we go through spiritual struggles and those kinds of things, the remnant is used in our defense. It's a way to kind of access the best part of people that the divine uses to, to move us along. So that's a little introduction to Remains. It would be cool to do a whole, whole show about it. I know he has a lot to say about it, like he had a lot to say about everything. So that's what I have to say about that. Thanks, Micah. Let's get a look to uh, the next one is going to be, oh, Mr. Jakey, YouTube. We explore the possibility of Swedenborg using psychoactive or hallucinogenic substances. Oh, man. I guess we already answered that because we got to the end of the show and we didn't really have much on it. However, I'm going to say the following. I have not come across any record of Swedenborg using those substances. There's a couple things I want to say about that. One is you would think, you know, he had a lot of people criticizing his work at the time. You'd think if he was, if people saw him smoking dope on this porch, that they're going to let, they're going to jump on that. It's going to be all over everything. But you don't hear about that. Also, just the fact that we don't have any records. You know, we asked, we had that letter. Hey, landlady, what's it like having Swedenborg live with you? Oh, he smokes opium all the time. They she didn't say that. She could have. Uh, none of you know. There, there's no record even within his own diary. Like, he d does a journal uh, where he journaled, he, not even the one we read from here, he journaled his dreams leading into his spiritual experiences. And with a level of person personal information in there, he even talks about sexually themed things in it. He doesn't mention taking substances. You'd think he would, you know, if he's going to talk about stuff that's that personal, he would let us in. But then finally, he was in this phase for 27 years without degeneration. What what drugs can you do for 27 years straight and be an 81-year-old guy and still be sharp enough to be publishing papers in the government and writing these books and indexing and all that kind of stuff? And what drug doesn't get progressive? What, you know, we, I, we had somebody on the show last week um, who was saying that they got on a bunch of cocaine and that fueled them being a good salesman, but it's temporary. I mean, you crash and the rest of your life falls apart right? Because you're continually trying to, and you run out of money, but none of these symptoms were showing up in Swedenborg's life. So it doesn't seem to me like he was, or, you know, it's certainly not doing it like all the time. And he was reporting these experiences all the time. Uh, so that, those are my thoughts on that. And if he was, I mean, so you have a chemical there. Uh, what is that? I mean, you still have this consistent world. Where did that come from? Is it ju is just the brain making it up? I don't know. That that would be another thing to explore, but I'm just saying there's not a lot of... You, there'd have to be pretty strong evidence that he was, and other than the fact that he saw angels that he could talk to the dead, there uh, there's not really records of him using it. Uh, then again, I don't know. We can't do a blood test, so it's up to everyone to decide individually. But it's a great question, and... Um, uh, I appreciate, it's not like people have to watch and you have to believe everything I'd say and, and be, you know, I, I just, you know, 
ask questions, think about it for yourself. That's what's cool. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let's take a look at another one. This is Blender on YouTube. Question for Curtis. If you got to ask Swedenborg one question, what would it be? And knowing what, what you know today about Swedenborg, how do you think he would answer your question? Man, I would like to ask him why, what are, what is the best way to model your life so that it's not as painful as it is? Meaning, I often, like I dig in Swedenborg's material, I was just thinking, I was just talking with my friend about this the other day, I dig in Swedenborg's material, and I find that he knows about the systems that underpin consciousness, he knows about what creates psychological phenomena in us, he knows about order and how you get in and out of it, are we trying, this is, if I was talking to him, hopefully he would understand that it was a compound question, because what I would say is, are we trying to have a, a life that is less painful, or is it just always because of the work we have to have done, is it going to get better? You know, can we use these techniques, this knowledge that you describe to make life good? Because there's times when the stuff he wrote lifts me way up, but there's other times when like stuff is going wrong in life and I, it, it's not enough to to make everything. But are we trying to make everything good? And how close can we get? It's like with disease physical disease, we are trying to get it so that we cure all diseases, right? Life expectancy has jumped, you know, since Swedenborg's time, in Swedenborg's day, he was 81 or something when he died. The life expectancy in Sweden for a male was like 37. So we've come up from there. Are we going to someday be able to cure all physical disease? And what I'd ask him is, can you cure mental disease? Meaning, does life have to suck or can it be good? So <laughs> that's my question. And knowing what I know of now, I have no idea. Um, um, just reading his letters and that kind of stuff. I think he would be friendly about it, and I don't, I don't know if he'd be able to give me specific advice. Maybe he would just say, like, go turn to God, try to find answers there. Because he sometimes gave specifics, and sometimes he would just say, you know, Providence has got to do it right for you. So I have no idea. But that's my question, and I'm sticking to it, those, like, four questions in a row. Thanks, man. That's an interesting one. Okay, let's take a look at another question. David, YouTube. Did Swedenborg know or correspond with any other people who had similar visions and experiences like his? Oh, great question. I don't think so. I, You know, I'm not... You know, in this episode, I had, you know, some experts come on and talk. I'm not as much an expert in what happened during his life as some are. I That said, I don't know of really any time when he wasn't like sitting around with other people who were uh, mediums, that kind of thing. And in his day, like as, as Jim Lawrence was saying, he was maybe like the first person to publish uh, saying, hey, I'm telling you facts about the spiritual world. So it might have been it wasn't as easy to come across. Today, yeah, you could find a lot of people who had had near-death experiences or... Um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of medium type experiences. I don't know if he ever found it. it. seemed like a lot of times he was alone. You know, there were some people that supported him, but no one really was going through what he went through. But that's my thought. I'd love to look into that more, though. That's a good question, David. Thank you. Uh, that's my only answer. Okay, let's take a look at another one. This is from Genrich on YouTube. What is the origin of evil? If God created evil to humble or test mankind, then how can he want everyone to be in heaven? Since if everyone ends up in heaven, there will be no hell, so no evil. Hence, what's the point of making evil in the first place? There's no evil allowed by God that does not bring good. What about the deeper kinds of evil? There's a lot of questions, and they happen to be all the hardest questions in the world, so I will answer them quickly now. Um, the origin of evil is evil is like coldness is, meaning it's the absence of good. This is what you get if God is good in truth and wants to fill everything. Only human beings have the ability to reject that inflow if you want, and evil is not a thing on its own. It is the opposite of good and truth. So if you take that stuff away, you start to get the depraved kind of stuff that we call evil. As far as how people got to be evil, this is all, of course, according to Swedenborg. I don't know this stuff on my own. Um, how people got to be evil initially, uh, I don't know the, the mechanism, but there was, people used to all live in harmony, and they were good, but people began to long initially for control over other people. How that first feeling came in, I don't know. Maybe it's, it, Swedenborg says we have to exist in a state of freedom, that freedom is essential, so it could be that evil 
Swedenborg says God doesn't create evil, but that that God withdraws from some place to create this evil that you can have tendencies toward uh, to create that freedom. It could be something like that. Um, so, uh, but it's not like today God is creating evil to test mankind. The evil that's here today is like genetically, we all carry our ancestors with us. Like the human genome is is passed down person to person. Swedenborg says that it's the spiritual genome is the same thing, that we inherit, that, that when somebody comes to love a certain kind of evil or good, it becomes part of their spirit. This is a little different than genetics, which doesn't get affected by the quality of life you have, but it becomes a part of their spirit and they pass it to their offspring. So we are in this state because there's been a lot of negativity before it built up in the human system so that we're actually born out of order into this state where we're inclined towards evil things. God is trying to bring us out of that, and sometimes evil is the only thing that can bring us out of it. Meaning, as we talked about in the last episode, how you end up in heaven or hell, take a look at that. Sometimes, if somebody's really devoted to evil, only some kind of disruption from another kind of evil can snap them out of it. And also, if your own evil, if you have evil inside you, the only way that you can get rid of it is to see it and understand it's evil and acknowledge it and reject it consciously. So you've got it's got a bubble up there. Um, so there's no evil that is allowed by God that does not bring good. What about the deeper kinds of evil? Um, I mean, Swedenborg certainly makes the first claim over and over, and that, that it's in providence, that the, the things I just described, those kinds of things, that people can see, when they see evil also, they learn what good truly is, that somehow, even though it seems impossible with, with how evil things can be, how harmful things can be, that there is good coming out of those things, even the deeper kinds, that God even takes people who are devoted to the deeper kinds of evil, and even if they don't realize it, is using them to help other people who, who are moving away from evil. Those are a few thoughts that, you know, you ask things that we should be doing several shows about, but that's a short version. Thanks. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Barb, YouTube, love learning all this stuff about Swedenborg. Did he have a wife and kids? The answer to that is, first of all, I'm glad you enjoy. I never thought I would see something like that. Love learning all this stuff about Swedenborg. Before we, before I had this channel, I knew about Swedenborg, but I didn't think anyone would be interested in him. So I, that's why you guys are cool, and that's why this has been a fun year. Uh, did he have a wife and kids? The answer is no. He, even though he wrote extensively about the importance of marriage and the spiritual bond, that, that marriage is like a foundational thing of heaven and that the propagation of the human race is this awesome thing, uh, Providence leads people to where they need to be, and he did not ever marry. He was, I believe in his younger years, he was engaged, but it was broken off before his spiritual phase, um, but he did not have a wife, did not have kids. Uh, he just wrote and wrote and wrote, so that's the story there, but he says that one thing Swedenborg wrote is that if even if you can't find a partner on this earth, one is given to you in the afterlife, so you got a wife now. <laughs> okay, all right, let's take another question. Um, Blender, YouTube, do you think there's any connection between Swedenborg's spiritual aptitude and his accomplishments in, accomplishments in science, etc.? The answer is yes. Swedenborg talks about himself, that, that he, as he saw it after the spiritual phase began, this is fun answering these questions, after he, he saw it after the spiritual phase began, that all of his life leading up to that was preparation for the spiritual thing, and that his is excelling in all the sciences was God through providence. Because if you have this foundation of knowing about the physical world, about how things work there, that op that gives you a template in which you can better understand spiritual things. Since there's this correspondence, and that all of that was pre and because was preparing him, and because of his studies in anatomy, um, because of his studies in all the different sciences, he was better able to be a vessel that that did this work. You know, why Swedenborg? Why not just anybody? It, it God couldn't just just, oh, I'm going to teach you everything about everything. He had to have this plane in which God could work in. So he already knew these things. He could make these connections. He could write. So he, uh, yes, the answer is there's a connection, and Swedenborg explicitly saw it. Okay, we're going to do two more. How many questions do we have? Uh, we'll do three more. There's three more. We'll do three more. That is fair. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. Uh, Oh, Mr. Jakey, what was Swedenborg's religious affiliation before his written works? Yes, he was a Christian. Uh, his father was a bishop, 
And Swedenborg was, uh, I think, you know, like a church-going Christian guy. I don't know. I don't know how to... He, he was certainly always very much a truth-seeker kind of guy. I don't know how much he bought into the church. He was around after his spiritual phase began. He really start he you he really started to become critical of the of the Christian church that he was in. Um the thing he goes after the most was the established Lutheran church. It's you know calling the, even though his writing has a lot of Christian themes in it, it deviates in huge ways from the Christian church, uh and and foundational ways. Um and he actually you know does a lot of calling out of them and describes in the spiritual world the problems the Christian church is causing. So he um after the spiritual experiences was was very much he, he was put on trial for heresy i mean people were people in the church were very upset at him for what he was publishing so um initially he was i guess more in line with it um but afterwards uh very much the opposite okay two more uh this is from blender youtube where did swedenborg find the time to do all of this yeah um he was able to focus with an incredible amount of energy, and he would just, he, that, that became the passion of his life. So he was, he was able to produce at a level that's almost incomprehensible, that I was talking to Jonathan Rose, I forget, it was something like 84 pages uh, of final document a week later in his life. Like, it's, if anyone's a writer, you know how, how incredibly hard that is, and to be doing everything else at the same time, this is what we're talking, this is, um, why the earlier stuff was preparation. He learned how to work, how to focus his mind, how to do this stuff, and then he just put the pedal to the metal. And I think he was so passionate about what he was doing that, um, that you know, he was able to carry on something like this. He felt like the mission was so important. So he found time by being fast and devoting his life to it. So, final question of the night. This one goes to Mark, YouTube. If Swedenborg was involved in the Lord's second coming, would you expect more Christians to believe this has already happened. Um, I don't know. Swedenborg never penetrated the Christian world too extensively. Um, I think, you know, so Swedenborg describes the Lord's second coming. This would be the second coming of Jesus as a new acknowledgement of, of God and a new kind of dawning of spirituality in the human mind and, and opening of an inner sense of the Bible, this kind of stuff. We actually talk about it in an episode of this show that is called The Spiritual Future of the Human Race. So check out that episode. Um, and so, and, and we do talk about in that episode that he would sometimes say that the material, he would say the material in his writings was the things that people would believe in this new church or the second coming, but he also said it was happening in areas uh, separate from his, so you don't have to, in areas separate from his works, so you don't have to be reading Swedenborg to be part of this second coming. The second coming of Jesus is something that happens in the mind. Not a lot of Christians bought into that, still not a lot do, we just, that's why you get people on the radio saying, December 21st, something, something, second coming of Jesus, and then it doesn't happen, and they push it back a couple of years. So anyway, those are a couple of thoughts on that. Everyone, thank you so much for your questions, your comments, your viewership. You guys made it possible for us to do this for a year, and also your donations made it possible. If you want to continue that, we got another grant at this 5 to 1 ratio. So if you become a member for $20 for a year, uh, we'll actually get five times that contributed to the foundation, or even if you put in a dollar, we'll get five times that. Everything helps. It just, you know, the program takes work, so we're we're trying to do work, and that takes resources. So I'm just, I said it. I said it. Okay, next week, we are going to take a look at how to free your mind from hell. So if that sounds interesting, join us then Monday next week. Thanks, everybody. Let's get ready for another good year.